Um, thank you for that. I, 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 I don't have to introduce myself anymore. That's very convenient. Um, but I am Martin. I am uh, part of the product management team at uh, Plexi. Been there for seven, eight, nine months, something along those lines. Um, some of you may have heard my voice explaining some of this on, uh, on Ethan and Greg's podcast uh, a couple of months ago. Um, I'm hoping to you know, speak a little slower this time. Um, I have a few slides. I don't have too many, so there's still some bacon, some bacon left to give to hungry kids. Uh, but I figured I'd do, I, I use a couple of slides just as pictures to, uh, to save myself from doing too much drawing, but I am going to go to the whiteboard. Um, what I'm going to try and do is explain in the next 45 minutes or so, explain some of the basic concepts behind Plexi. You know, Matt's already mentioned affinities. Go a little bit through what, what is this thing called an affinity. And then I'm going to explain the, the, the network portion of, of a Plexi solution. And I'm, I'm going to deliberately skip a little bit around about how we define, how, we, how you actually define an affinity and, and how we actually you know, control the network, uh, you know, define topologies and those sort of things. I'll let that to Simon. Simon's actually going to walk through uh, hopefully mostly a whiteboard session with perhaps a little bit of demo. Um, but I want to make sure that you have a fundamental understanding of what is that physical thing that we build, right, this, this uh, these affinities on top of. Uh, we've tried these discussions the other way around as well, um, and especially for those that are uh, you know, uh, very well versed in networking, it's always good to give sort of the, the networking view first and then layer the other stuff on top. So that's what I'm going to try and do. My handy dandy remote. So to, to give you an example um, of you know, this concept of affinities, what are affinities? Microsoft did a, a study a couple of years ago, three years ago, um, actually probably not four years ago, and they measured um, communications between 1,500 servers in one of their data centers. So they essentially instrumented 1,500 servers and they, they measured all the communications between them. And the servers were essentially numbered from you know, top left is number one all the way to 1,500 uh, at the end. And they collected a whole ton of data. I mean, the, um, the paper that's mentioned below, you can find it on, on the internet. Um, it's got a whole bunch of data associated with that, but the one that we picked out was with this scatter plot that they created. And this scatter plot represents uh, what they believe was about a, a 10 second representative sample of communications between servers. And the, the red, the darkness of the red, give an indication of how much communication was happening between servers in that 10 second sample that they, that they picked. And there's a lot of interesting things you can see in this, right? There is obviously, um, you know, the first thing that you, that you very obviously see is this, this diagonal pattern. Now, in the, in the paper it's explained, right? This was a, a very well um, engineered data center, right? Applications were carefully placed uh, together if they had uh, some sort of relationship, uh, if, they, if they was expected to have a lot of uh, network communication between them, they would place them you know, within a rack or, or right next to each other. So there, there was quite a bit of thought that had gone in, where do we place the application within this 1500 server uh, server data center? Um, and what you see, the diagonal line, if you, if you sort of look at what that means you know, from and to, that means that servers that were numbered close together had a lot of communication together. Fairly obvious, right? If you, if you place applications uh, that have you know, a network relationship with each other in the same rack, in the same rack, they're going to they're communicate like that, and it's going to show up like that. So that's sort of the obvious pattern. This is sort of a you know that was the exact point of their engineering. Let's make sure that those that communicate often are are nice and close together. But there was a whole bunch of other patterns that you can see in there. You can see here the you know, horizontal lines and the vertical lines, and the horizontal lines essentially said right there's certain servers that everybody talks to. Right? If you take you know. Take one of this one, or one up here, or one in the middle. All these servers want to talk to that one specific destination server. Similarly, in the other way around, for a vertical, right, there are certain servers that speak to almost everybody else. So there's, there's, there's patterns here. Now, the biggest pattern that you, you know, is perhaps not obvious until you do this, is how few servers actually communicate with each other. Right. The vast majority of this is, right, if, you, if you turn this way, is red. And red means here they do not communicate at all. Right. So you've built this entire infrastructure for you know, very sparse communications between, between servers in a fairly well-engineered network. Now, 
Obviously, things change, right? This is, this is about three, three and a half years ago. Um, this is not a virtualized environment, right? So these were specific ser servers with specific applications. But it very clearly shows that there's applications that have relationships with each other, right? There's obvious communications patterns here uh, between applications that live in certain places. And those applications, while we may virtualize them and we may break them apart a little bit, these relationships, these relationships still exist. Uh, what's going to make it harder is, in this case, you can actually, Microsoft knowing their applications fairly well, they can be fairly clever in their engineering of where do I place these applications to make sure that I get you know, the best connectivity or the best needed connectivity you know, for those applications by placing them near each other. In a virtualized environment, now, I don't actually believe that anybody's going to build a virtual environment where any application can just randomly go everywhere. But the amount of control, the amount of distribution of applications or pieces of applications is likely going to be slightly more distributed than in a network that is one server, one application, very carefully engineered. These relationships between applications don't change. However, these applications now start to move a little bit. Right? Again, I'm not a believer that this is going to randomly move from anywhere. But you are going to see, especially these pockets here, they're going to get a little wider. Right? You're going to define a set of racks or a cluster of servers that run an application or a set of applications. It may not be an entire data center, but they're going to be a bunch of them that are somewhere near each other. So these relationships exist. Now, if you don't take that, if you make the assumption that these relationships are going to exist, they exist now, uh, they existed then, they will exist now, um, you can actually point out where these relationships are. Right? I mean, the obvious ones obviously are the diagonal ones. But there's a whole bunch of little bubbles. I just, I just you know, drew a circle around some of them that are very obvious relationships between, a, between applications, communications relationship between applications. That's the basic concept behind what we call an affinity. An affinity is a set of applications that have a communication relationship between each other. And as you can see, it is not everybody to everybody. This is not a, I'm going to build right, a a 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 uh, endpoint data center, and I am going to expect everybody's going to come talk to everybody. They may at some point for a very little bit of, of data, but ultimately the sheer, the most volume of the data is going to be you know, articulated between certain sets of applications. That's what we. I have no idea why it does that. That's. That's what affinities are, relationship between applications. Now, once you have relationships between applications, uh, and once you have some sense of trying to articulate what they are, maybe you want to describe what they need. Right? Instead of just saying, OK, I, I know there's, there's applications that need to communicate, perhaps you can quantify a little bit of what type of communication these applications are expecting. Right? Are they expecting lots of bandwidth? Are they expecting low latency? Are they expecting to be separated from everybody else? Are they expected to get preferential treatment over someone else? Like there's a whole bunch of things that sort of naturally we can come up with of describing what applications would like to have uh, in their communications. That is the concept behind affinities. The ability to articulate what applications need, right? which, can, which applications need to communicate, not exclusively, but which are the ones that we care the most about, and some set of attributes that describe what kind of communications do we want those applications to have. That's what affinities are. Let me pause for a second. Is that a clear enough explanation of affinities? Yeah, good. Now, so Plexi took that notion of affinities and they're like, okay, so <clears throat> if we understand that we believe that there is a relationship between applications and how they communicate and we want to describe how they want to communicate, um, we should be able to actually create a network infrastructure that provides that to those applications. Right? That is the notion of what affinity networking solves. Right? We take the, the start of Let's ask the applications, right? and some applications can articulate them by themselves. Some we need to do, we, you know, the, the operators need to do it as a proxy of describing what these applications need. But let's take those applications that are really important, not every single one of them, the ones that are really important, and describe what kind of communication they need between, between what members of that cluster or, or set of applications. Once we know that, 
Um, can we build a topology? Can we build a network topology that matches what we need? And we're not just talking about can we forward packets the right way? That's where we started, but like Matt said, can we actually build a physical topology that best matches what we've just described as what the applications really need? And once we've built that, can we then take the knowledge of these affinities and layer the traffic on top of you know, that topology, that physical and logical topology that we've just created? That's what we do. We define affinities, we create a physical network topology, and then we layer the traffic on top of that to best match the description or the attributes that have been described for those affinities that have been articulated. And then when we need to, we can change it. Uh, yes. I mean, the, the beauty of all of this is this is not a one-time shot. Right? If this is a one-time shot, you can do this as a, right, a, a, a pre-sales or pre-installation network engineering event. Right? You can go figure out what you want, you know, design it, implement it, wire it, and you know, be done with it. Um, things change, applications change. Uh, applications um, upgrade, they get bigger, they get smaller, they, get, they disappear, uh, their communication changes, right? So these relationships between applications changes. They don't necessarily change on a you know, minute by minute basis, but over time they will change. And what we want to make sure we can provide is a mechanism that you can actually change the network along the way with the changing need of these applications whether that's traffic related, whether that's application related, whether that's changing requirements. Right? We want to be able to take that information, recalculate topology, both physical and logical topology, and reapply that to the network. It's dynamic. I'm almost at the end of my slides, Ethan, so <laughs> make, 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 sure, make sure we get some bacon left. Very good. All right, so I, want, I, wanted to, this, uh, I, I wanted to put this picture in there because I cannot draw this on the whiteboard. Um, I could, but it wouldn't look anywhere near as pretty as this. This is our switch, right? As Matt explained, we believe we need a mechanism to implement that dynamic topology, physical and logical topology. Um, right, whenever we take, if we were to take, and this is, you know, this was part of, before my time, but part of the initial thought process in Plexius, can we apply this to pick your, pick your random switch? And pieces of it, probably, because right, you'll find, I'll explain in a minute here, we're, we're using uh, you know, standard commercial silicon in here, so there's other switches that have that as well. Um, but there is this part of physical topology, right? Can we change the connectivity of how this switch connects to other switches? Can we change that on the fly? Can we change that based on what the affinities are looking for, based on what you know, we've described as what the network needs. Um, such a switch doesn't exist, which was sort of the trigger for us to say, we need to build our own hardware to allow us to change, physically change the network uh, connectivity uh, between all the switches. So let me, let me just walk through it. Right from the front, it looks, you know, it looks fairly common. It's a uh, you know, 10 giggy porch, 32 10 giggies. Uh, you'll see there's one, two, three, four QSFPs on here. Um, Plain Ethernet, 40 giggy, 10 giggy, you know, what you would see from, from everyone else. Uh, various console connectors, everything else. I don't show the back here, but the back's got fans, it's got power supplies, it's got, you, you take yourself a, a standard 1U topper rack switch, and you know, the front's going to look pretty similar to this, except for this connector here on the left. Right? The connector on the left is our, our mechanism of interconnecting switches together. It's, a, it's, a, it's an NTP um, connector, which is a standard connector. Uh, it's got 12 fibers coming out of, uh, coming out of each port, six, uh, six in and six out. Um, and that's how we create a topology between our switches. And I have a picture a little bit later, and then I have the whiteboard to go and explain that. But if you open up the switch, you'll see that it's a little bit different. Right? You may notice that this is actually fairly, fairly deep right? for, a, for, a standard, uh, for a standard 1U topper rack switch. Uh, if you look at the components inside it, obviously we've got the, the front ports with the transceivers and all that stuff. Uh, we have a CPU complex. Uh, we're actually using uh, a multi-core i5 with 8 gig of memory, so it's, it's got a pretty, pretty beefy and powerful CPU complex in there. Commercial switching ASIC. Um, again, no secret, we're using, uh, we're using Broadcom uh, switching ASIC in here. Um, I'm using Trident Plus today, uh, Trident 2 give it a month or so. Uh, and then, you know, 
you open up everybody else's top rack, thinking you top rack switch, and this is going to look pretty much the same. This part is almost going to be the same. It's at the end where things are a little bit different. And the first thing you notice is this and a whole bunch of, bunch of wires. With the premise that we want to change the physical topology of how switches are connected, right? the only real way to do that is one wireless, uh, not necessarily a good option just yet. Uh, give it a couple of years and maybe it will be. The other one is optical multiplexing. So we're actually using um, optical multiplexing, WDM, um, inside the switch uh, to connect two other switches. So this whole complex in here that you see with you know, a whole bunch of wires, these are a whole bunch, in this case, 24 uh, optical transceivers that go to um, a little bit of plexi optical magic, let's call it that. Um, but essentially, right, this is a, a combination of some muxing, uh, some demuxing, some cross connect, right, some, some optical pieces in here that allow us to take 24 10 giggy channels out of our switching ASIC, mux them together, and then bring them out these front panel ports. That's ultimately what we do. And these front panel ports, um, you'll see in a minute, we, we actually connect these switches together uh, in a ring topology. It's one go to the left, a physical, uh, you know, one cable goes to the switch on the left, one switch, cable goes to the switch on the right, and we create a ring topology with that. But on top of these connectors here, there's 24 10 gigi channels that are running over that ring interconnect um, to the switches near us. So is that 12 by 10 east, 12 by 10 west? Uh, y yes. So there is, um, I'll explain that in, in, in a minute. So there is a, we've picked a default topology of where those 24 um, 10 giggy wavelengths sort of end up going. Um, we actually have the ability to change that. So you can actually redirect waves from one place to the other. But your basic premise is correct. There's 12 going one way and, and 12 going the other way. Um, beyond that, right, power supplies, obviously two power supplies, they're like 650 or 660 watts. Uh, the switch will only consume similar to what another top rack switch will consume 200, 250 watts or something like that. But that's the physical switch, right? And, and, and the key in here is um, yes, it, it's a, it's a, it looks like a top of rack switch, right? But you know, the main thing that's different in here is that we need this, we needed a mechanism to change how switches are connected together. Right? If we believe that um, our affinities tell us that we need more bandwidth to one side of the network than the other side of the network, we want the ability to move that bandwidth and not just you know, by allocated QoS and everything else. We actually want to physically move bandwidth from one side of the, of, of the ring to another side of the ring or between one switch uh, to another switch. And that's what the optical technology allows us to do. I'll get to how that topology looks in a second. Any questions on the physical switch? Yes? So is it a rotor, essentially? I mean, it, it sounds like you can reconfigure the channels. So we can. Reconfigure the channels, but not in a rotom way. It, it's more of a, think about it as a, uh, a cross connect. So it, there is basic muxing and demuxing. Uh, then we get into a cross connect, and within the cross connect, we can redirect waves back out to somewhere else. Now, someone has thought a little further here is, oops, might say, well, if you got 24 channels, 24 waves, this is CWDM uh, in this specific instance, uh, 24 channels. We reuse a few because there's not that many in CWDM. Do I really need 12 fibers or six fibers in each direction to go and do that? Let me explain that in a minute as well. There's a reason why we've got uh, a few more fibers than you would possibly need. You could probably get away with, with four fibers uh, for 24 channels, but I'll explain to you why we have that. So my last slide, so that uh, the hungry kids can eat some bacon. Um, I'll stop using that now. I think, I, I think I've overused it already. Um, so, as I mentioned, right, so, so physically our switches are connected in a ring topology, right? So uh, switch one is connected to switch two on one side and switch, I don't know, 10, 12, whatever it is on the other side, and we physically create a ring. Now, that's just a physical wiring, right? So there's physical wiring from each switch through these NTP cables to my switch on the left and my switch on the right. Um, 
Let me get to physical topology first. And then I'll explain the, the control of the Also, as you can see, it's best mentioned, there's some software on the right. Yeah, there, there's but some. I'm gonna, the, the, after mine's finished, I'm going to talk a lot about the software because the software is the key element to how we control this. We wanted to lay the foundation for the hardware. Program. working too well, you think? Better mark it. I'll get there. So if you, if you take a, a ring topology, I need to draw a few more here. So physically, these switches are connected just like up there. But that's just a physical. Those are just where the wires happen to go. We haven't actually talked about how those 24 uh, 10 gig wavelengths, how those sort of end up, where they, where they end up. So we have, uh, we call it a base topology. It is when you take the box, you take it, you take it out, you power it on, you connect it to the switches next to you. Um, what happens? Where do, those, where do those 24 waves end up? And let me do it in a different color, assuming that I can find one that works. So if I take this switch as an example, um, if the switch just starts up without doing anything else, there is, these are the, the waves that I'm drawing here. These are all 10 gig waves. So those waves are, are actually configured in such a way that this switch has four 10 gig E waves, so 40 gig E connectivity to the switches right next to it. It then has two 10 gig E's connectivity to the switches one step away. Same with two step away, three and four in one direction, and very similar in the other direction. 40 gig E to my, neighbors, uh, to my neighbor immediately on the left, 20 gig E to the one beyond that, 20, 20, and 20. That's how those 24 waves are initially deployed. Now, obviously, because there's only a cable that goes from here to here to here to here, right, these two waves here pass through this cable to this cable to this cable, and then here ultimately they terminate into what's called the Broadcom. In the Broadcom, that's where they end up being a physical you know, Ethernet connection, a point to point connection between this switch, between this switch. Uh, and that switch over there. They pass through the switches optically, not through the, not through the switch hops. Yeah, so you know, this connectivity here, this, this, this optical connectivity that passes through here is completely passive. And this is the reason why we need those extra fibers. Right? We want to make sure that we can actually take these waves and pass it through four switches on either, either side of us without that switch needing any configuration, any power, any active components. So that's why we layer these waves on top of a few more fibers than we would actually need, but allows us to take certain one of these fibers and simply passively pass them through from switch to switch to switch without needing a single electrical component in between. So in this case, I can actually power down this switch and this switch. This connectivity will remain. As long as these <coughs> cables are plugged in, that connectivity will remain because it, it passively passes through. Is there a reason you didn't use dense wave? Awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, dense, dense, wave, dense wave optics are probably, if you, the, the ones that we would have to use internally are probably somewhere between $800 and $1,000 each. Mm -hmm. um, 24 of those, right, starts that up. Um, now, again, right, so today we use CWDM because it was you know, the most effective way for us to go and do that. We're not necessarily married to CWDM or anything, anything like that. It was just a very convenient and cost-effective way for us to achieve what we want. Right? What we wanted is we want connectivity between switches that we can change. Right? Because while this may be our default topology, right? switch comes up, this is, this is how they will be connected, 
I can actually, because of the, the optical components in here, I can actually take, because obviously this guy has the same thing, right? He's got one, two, three, four here, one, two, three, four. And he's got that, two there, two there, right? He's got all that as well. So you create this entire mesh. Uh, I can actually take, if I need more connectivity between these two switches, it's like, oh, I got 20. My affinities really could use 30 or 40 gig of direct connectivity between this switch and that switch over there. I can actually steal it. I can actually take these two, optically connect them through. So it looks like these guys are actually directly connected, right, simply by configuring the optics in here to redirect that. Without a switch hop, I'm, I'm going optically all the way through from one si this switch to this switch. I now all of a sudden have 40 gig between these two switches. So you had mentioned you could pull two of those guys out as long as they, you were still through as past all that kind of stuff, but because you were effectively hypercube, logically. Yes, in a sense. You can pull those two totally out of the mix, and because I have a path back to other people, I still have a, Correct. I have the other half of the circle. So Correct, right? I mean, so the so from, from a ring perspective, right, and, and I was hoping someone was going to ask a, you know, 1990s token ring kind of question, um, <laughs> but you didn't, which is which is good. So well, I, mean, I got one that was a problem. Do you support 16,000 byte NTUs? 16 byte NTUs? 16,000? 16, 16, you can do 16,000 byte tokens? Am I the only person that remembers that? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. No, I remember you 64,000. Oh, I know it was ha half prompted, but you get the, uh, the, the, the token for that. Wow. So physically it's a ring, right? But yeah. there's, there's no tokens, right? There's no concept of that. This is just a pure mechanism of uh, convenient connectivity for yeah. right, never expanding thing. What you see is right, the red lines here actually indicate the real connectivity between the switches, which are Physically, point, to po yeah. point to Logically, point to point. Absolutely correct. You can create an overlay. You can say, this switch has 12 connections that you can then terminate anywhere. Correct. So if you want a 10 gig here, you've got a loop going two ways, 110, 110, terminate it. Correct. If you want 40, then take two 20s. Correct. And then 40. Correct. But you'd be, you've got finite number of IOs on the fabric in the core. In the Absolutely, system. right? I mean, so every every switch here, I mean, obviously, right, the way we've divided it, every switch here is 24 waves that leave the box, right? That we've designated as, you know, in, in someone else's solution, that's okay, I'm not, yeah. In someone else's solution, it may be an uplink port, right? Or if it's a spine and leaf, right, those are your, your uplinks to your spine. But we've designated 24 ports um, out of the 64 in, 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 in the current case, out of the 64, we've designated those to, let's call them fabric connections, optic connections, whatever they may be. And like, those we've layered or connected to other switches within that, within that ring. So, 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 I, sorry. Oh, so I get the architecture, that's mm -hmm. great. How does this scale? How does this scale beyond what you've draw, drawn up there? So, so there, because there's- Because you have, you have physical and passive path. So how do you scale that? So, so today, right, so the, the connectivity that we do, so the, the optics that we have and, and the way we've got them layered, right, the connectivity with the lost budgets and everything else, the connectivity that we have is um, five, five switches to our left and five switches to our right. That's how far we can go without exceeding our loss budget, our optical loss budget, right? Well, hold on. Okay. Well, That's all the <laughs> But you can make this ring as large as you want it to make. Right? I drew 11 here, which creates a full mesh of connectivity between all the switches. I can create a ring of 20 switches. I won't have a full mesh. Every switch will see the five switches nearest to it, so you get lots of partial meshes that have a connectivity. And for me, from switch one, right, if I got uh, 20 switches in the network, for me, switch one to get to switch 10, I obviously do not have direct connectivity, right? so my path is going to go from switch one to switch five to switch 10. That's how I get there. Now, at some point, does that diameter turn into, okay, how many hops do I have to get through to get from one place to the other? Um, no, there, there is, and it's going to be different for every customer. There's no logical, huh. we, we, we put a heart limit of 250 in there, just because it's a, like, sounded like a good number. Um, so we're guys saying, how much do you want us to test? <laughs> we have to give uh, it so that there, there's, no, there's no real physical limitation. There, there becomes an, a, a deployment or an architectural solution, architectural you know, limitation to say like, okay, if I need to get from the extreme left of my network to the extreme right of my network, um, how many hops can I endure? Now, remember, with the affinities, we can actually start stitching these things together optically, right? So if I have a ring of 20 of these, 
and I have an affinity that tells me that there's a set of applications here and a set of applications there that have a, a high, high bandwidth or a low latency need to communicate, I can actually optically string these together so that it looks like they have a direct path between them. And you can do that 25, you can do that how far deep though? Optically. There's no there's no limit because it gets regenerated. Okay, because you're effectively dedicating your true physical path to do that. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the way to think, if you think about this as a linear line, right, every switch has essentially like a wingspan of, of five to five, and, and, and that kind of creates this overlapping uh, thing. And, 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 you know, so there are cases where you may want to, uh, you know, go beyond it, but there, there is still, still some locality and, and benefit to locality, right? Um, what we want to be able to do is also accommodate uh, you know, the other case, maybe that's a demotion or a well, it goes back to your original thing from Microsoft that they were very intelligent about how they laid the sure. things out. What they couldn't right. do is they couldn't affect the architecture. Right. So you're smart about how you lay it out right. and you use your architecture to draw the straight line. So Again. You're absolutely correct. I right? just, and and there, 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 is a, there is a premise in our solution, right, that there is, there is locality in communications within a data center. I'm good. Right? And locality in Microsoft's terms, right, that locality was enforced by hand, right? They actually put applications near each other. In a virtual life environment, that will get a little bit more gray, but you guys tell me if I'm wrong. I'm not a believer that people will build a uniform data center of thousands of servers and applications just go willy-nilly wherever the heck they need to go. Right? People will designate areas of applications um, right, where they have perhaps some freedom within a set of racks or within a set of servers that people can move and do their backups. But I'm not expecting people to just go randomly assign applications to wherever the heck they wanted to put within a data center and therefore have random communication needs. I kind of agree with you. I would like that to happen. I am learning that that is not happening. That server people just are all over the place and don't seem to be able to plan. Because one of the things I'd like for troubleshooting is some localization as in vMotion occurs between this set of racks. And maybe it's some here and some there. But if I have a physical layer problem, I want to correlate that with my application problem. But what I'm consistently hearing is, ain't going to happen to you. Um, so, and not to challenge you. No, I, no I, I'm, 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 I'm with you. It, to me, it's like, so it, it's almost like, so the network is, is one part of driving that, right? Because regardless of how good any of our solutions are going to be, local switching is always going to be cheaper, better, higher performance than remote switching, right? Regardless of whether it's our solution or someone else's, Right? There is a there is a cost of going further away. Storage, will, in my mind, storage will actually be the one that drives locality more than anything else. Well, what I'm seeing is it's a function of how data centers get built out. Nobody wants to incur the cost of building a separate a set of empty racks until they absolutely have to. And so what happens is you have space wars, and you can't put new servers, new hypervisor hosts into existing racks to preserve locality. And then you get this new row built out, and everybody and their cousin needs to expand their uh, services into that new. Well, so just a, a quick point yeah. too. You know, what we're talking about here is also the, the simplest implementation of this, yeah. right? So what we, we actually see our customers doing is, you know, sometimes they need a really sparse uh, thing like in a cloud environment where tenants are generally, you know, not going to communicate with other tenants across the data center, right? So they they can build it very sparse. Uh, in a in a more classic enterprise data center, they may build smaller rings and connect them together. Um, today we do that uh, by connecting electrically, um, but our in, in our roadmap we actually have a, a product coming out where we can actually create a, uh, what we call a, um, a two-dimensional or a four-dimensional ring essentially. So instead of just being able to go east-west, now I can optically connect across my rings. And, and that probably answers my other question, which cool. is every time you stitch, you're using up scarce resources. Correct. Oh, and yeah. correct. understanding so, that. It's like using, in DWDM, <clears throat> you're using up lambdas. So I, you're, you're absolutely correct, right? And, and you know that's why there's, in terms of scaling, right, I mean, there, there's logical scaling of how big would you grow one ring right, before you run out of you know, those type of resources. Right? We're not putting a limit on it, but there's going to be a practical deployment limit, which is going to be different right, depending on how well and near the data center is. Uh, for us to grow to hyperscale um, is not so much to grow a ring and just you know keep growing and growing and growing. Uh, we are actually going to add dimensions, right? So instead of having one ring, um, you know, our goal is to get, and this is actually not that far away, our goal is to do this. Right? Is to actually create Manhattan-style grids of rings interconnected that way, with full connectivity optically and electrically 
right, across across all of those. The key thing is once we have the computational power to, to compute paths, which is where we, when we talk about the software, um, because really what this boils down to is a math problem, right? If I have all these different ways to get from here to here, and I, my goal is to leverage the advantage of, of the optical stuff and apply that to workloads that care about it, whether it's for uh, you know low hop count or for high bandwidth, I can figure all that out in software. So once I once I solve that problem, I can apply lots of different ways to actually make that you know give me more computer freedom to, to solve that problem. So you know before we go on to the forwarding architecture, it just leads us to say, look, what we the net of this is what we've done is said least find didn't work for what we were trying to do because it, it basically has a fixed wiring pattern, right? And I kind of said we want to free the wires. Um, and if you look at kind of least find, you say, okay, I have to kind of decide my oversubscription from day one when I, when I cable the network. Uh, what we wanted to do is have a variable oversubscription. We wanted to say, okay, this part of the network needs, you know, really low oversubscription. This part may need really high oversubscription. You can't, you can't easily do that when you statically kind of allocate the capacity based on our wiring pattern. So, what we've tried to do is replace the, the spine layer with a, a more flexible optical layer, uh, and, and that's kind of what you see um, here. So, I've got a, a couple of questions. So, uh, with 10 gig ports on each of the switches, I'm assuming in most data centers, or at least a lot of them, you're going to be having you know, a top of row switch sitting below that linking up to it, unless you have all your servers on 10 gig, right? Um, is there support for Ethernet aggregation or MLAG or something along those lines? So, so, so there, there is, right? So there is a. Um, um, we can actually do a, a, a few things here. Um, we can do, <coughs> we can do multi-homing like this, mm -hmm. either from a from a single switch or from a single server, right? Ser <coughs> servers that are multi-homed, um, right? And in the case of you know a server, this will appear as a as a lag group. Of course, for us, it's la m lag ish. It's not m lag because <coughs> we got our own way of dealing, you know, with. Preventing loops and all those sort of things, which is what that is. Uh, but ultimately, what this does is it will accept traffic on either one of these links, uh, and then we will load balance the destination MAC addresses between between the two links on the way back. Okay. And we've talked about switching, which layer two. Mm -hmm. How about layer three? Is there so let, so let me let me explain layer two forwarding mm -hmm. on top of this, right? Because I, I've only talked about physical so far. I haven't even talked about how we actually forward traffic. So let me explain. How we actually build forwarding topologies on top of that, and, and then you know, get to get to layer three, how that works. I'll squeeze in one layer, one question, real quick, <laughs> before we get out of that. Do you is there what's the latency implication of not doing an OEO uh, trans, you know, in between on your transit L2 or actually your transit physical nodes? Is there what's the latency? Is, is, there, so, is there any reduction there by that? So, so a, you know, a, a switch, a regular switch hop, right, which is the same as everybody using this chipset, right? It's six, seven, eight hundred nanoseconds on the current uh, version of, of Trident, and it'll drop to four, five hundred or so in the next version, right? Which is standard Broadcom latency, um, right? So, if you were actually do switch hops, right, and I'll get to the forwarding architecture in a second. If you do switch hops from here to here, here, you would incur that latency every time you go through that. Optically, right, we're talking, and it doesn't really matter how many switches you go through. Uh, you know, we're talking in the order of 20 to 30 nanoseconds right, to get from one place to the other. There's a little bit of delays. There's no delay in the transceiver. There's really no, no delay in terms of distance, unless you run these really far. Uh, the transceivers we have in it can actually run 10 kilometers, so you can pull them apart quite a bit, but the distance is not really there. It's the, it's the actual muxing and demuxing that's consuming most of the uh, delay here. So, so you, it, you're not photonic end to end. So you, your lambda is terminating on each box as you go. No, um, it it is so, truly it is truly passive. Okay, so you're all optical, the way through here. Yeah. Okay. Great. You're optical all the way through. They they're they're right. So the, this is what I meant, right? You can actually you can actually power these guys off. Yeah. And we'll go through. It is it is purely it is purely passive. Only other thing is, so I assume you can drain traffic. So when you need to add a node into the ring, and then when you're adding second rings. That sounded like you said that would be electric, and then in the future, theoretically, there'd be a four way. Like two degrees, right? Okay. Um, so so we, four we have four gig ports, we stack them like kind of stack donuts. Um, and the, 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 the product that's going to come out later this year is going to have uh, an extra two degrees, so you can actually cable. Uh, you know, we, we don't like to say north south because we're, we're trying to think flat, uh, but you know, it's uh, yeah. two pairs of east and two pairs yeah, of west. Yeah, so like east, east one and east two. Yeah. I'm going to throw one more. I'm going to throw one more base layer question yeah. real quick. This yeah. is technology that at best has been boiled down to a metro play before. Mm -hmm. You guys have brought it to the data center. Correct. Because it's played metro and carrier in the past, 
with the right optics, could you effectively extend this between long haul data centers and do a full yep. mesh over long haul data centers? So um, it's probably a topic we can talk about for another hour or two. Um, yes or no is cool. So, so, <laughs> so the, the answer is absolutely the answer is absolutely yes, yes right? With with the the optics that are currently built into this, right? We can we can push this about ten kilometers. Mm -hmm. Depends a little bit on the lost budget and what sits in between. Um, there is other solutions. I'd be happy to draw those on a whiteboard with you. There's other solutions where we can actually bring this and bring specific lambdas into either CWM into true optical carrier equipment, uh, transform it to VWM, whatever it may be, and actually transport this this well across. Cool. Right? Even though this cable, right, the, the cable that we have here, it, it may look unusual, but it's, it's standard NTP <coughs> cable. Um, we can actually break it out, right? We can actually take one of these, break it out into 12 individual um, you know, SC connectors uh, to a patch panel, and we can take each one of these to wherever we want to be. I did, there's how we layer the waves on top of these fibers is, is very well defined. So we can actually pick and choose if you need to take a specific portion of these and want to bring them out to long distance um, optical gear, you can absolutely do that. Excellent. Sir, in the back. Hi, Mark. I got a question for you. Two things. What if one of those switches loses power? What happens? If it, if Which it's connected one? in a ring. Uh, pick one. Like pick the one. Switch. So, so this know. one, right? This one loses power right here? Yeah, so there you go. the only thing that you will lose is all traffic that goes to or through this switch, electrically, electrically to or through this switch. Right? Optical, this never sees a difference. This never sees a difference, right? So the connectivity, optical connectivity through here, not impacted whatsoever. It's only traffic that terminates on here or is otherwise, and I need to get to my forwarding calls again, mm -hmm. is otherwise part of you know, electrical so or switching the forwarding. Pass through. Optical so the pass through. pass through, lose a switch, the ring's not broken. Correct. It's not Correct. Good. These these guys will these these guys all the switches talk to each other, right? They yeah. they realize who's on the ring, they realize who their neighbors is. This guy will realize his neighbor is gone, we'll see that his new neighbor is this guy, and they just keep going as if nothing's happened. Signal about to the S D. Right. Now, the so, other thing is, if I start reconfiguring the 10 gigs, does that, does that interrupt it? Does that interrupt my spanning gigs, tree or my trill? Ten, or so there's no spanning tree, there's no trill. Right. Um, one of the nice things about, so actually that's a perfect introduction. Uh, let, let me hold on that because it, it brings me to 40. Yeah. So, so if, if you continue that one step farther though, you got to replace that switch because the power supply is dead and it just didn't lose power. What happens there? So if if you 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 so you're absolutely you're absolutely correct. If you need to replace this switch, obviously you need to unplug this here. You will interrupt communication between us. So you are correct. Okay. So you there's, there's plenty of other paths to get through that, but you will interrupt. Right. So you know, see active the, kind the of control activity. architecture. You'll see what what are the benefits of SDM that we can leverage here is we can pre-compute failure scenarios. We pre-compute pre all the failure scenarios, so we can we can know that ahead of time. Um, so if there is a cable break, and you'll, you'll see this uh, in a second, um, we already know that we can reroute that traffic in, in other directions, right? And, and all, those, uh, all that information has already been pushed down to the switch. It says, hey, if this happens, here's a set of backup paths for you to take. Um, and it's, it, it, you know, the, the benefit of having the controller always looking at the topology and seeing, okay, what's going on, is that it can run those calculations constantly and say, okay, I, I can do this. Well, part of part part isolated part part unless there's a break in two different places on the rig. Correct. That was part of my forwarding discussion right. that was, but I'm trying to get to it. Sorry. <laughs> from a capacity perspective, you're not just losing connectivity to your neighbors, you're also losing five either side pass through. Correct. Right? So we're not just losing 40 gig friendly stuff, we're losing actually 24 channels worth of, albeit recalculatable bandwidth, but that's a massive hit. So that's, I guess that's the downside is you've got a lot of bandwidth floating around, but when you do break the ring, you have an awful lot of bandwidth to remove potentially. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure that it's all all 240 of everything that goes through, but but but, but yes, the, there there is connectivity that needs to be moved. The key thing to remember here is how often do you in a in a large data center want to go in and and grab a device, rip it out, and then replace it again without informing an off staff. I think it was Tom who said yesterday, plan for the absolute worst case scenario. That's and then actually then you're fine. That's where pre-calculating backup paths is, is true, but for um, sort of the administrative procedure for removing the physical device. So first off, device fails, you power it off, or you don't power it off, uh, you don't lose a lambda. Right. So that will just go completely through. 
as soon as you know you have to replace that, you know, shows that the complexity control device has a failure. Um, the intent is for an administrative procedure to kick in and say, you know, remove this section of the ring out of production. In other words, drain the traffic hitless to other uh, parts of the network. At, at that point, both of the east and west of the device that failed are essentially not carrying any traffic whatsoever. Um, remove it out, put it back in, enable it to re-enable the complexity control, uh, recalculate topology, and off you go again. So, so, so as really long as you have administrative procedures right. in place. Okay, so really what it comes down to is you want to make sure that if you ever have to pull something out of the ring, either to replace it or to insert a new switch in the ring, be smart, do it at a time of minimum capacity anyway, so that you're not impacting as you have to shift that traffic somewhere else and recalculate. Yeah, yeah. So but, but, but I think, and once I get through the forward topology, right, we can actually proactively move that traffic away from that switch before you pull it out. No, right? I, I understand. I understand. Okay. But the point is, yes. if you're running anywhere near capacity, that's a big chunk to lose. So Fair. I guess, perhaps logically, it's, you're it's kind of equivalent that. to losing a line card in the spine, right? Because you have. Right. Lots of capacity coming to that one line card. The other logical step to this, and you're probably going to get to it with the software, if you're running totally virtual workloads, you can probably have some sort of integration with your orchestration layer. Mm -hmm. And if you have to drain that, you can literally drain resources away from the right. gap exactly. back towards the high density aggregate area. Right. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me, let me spend about 10 minutes on forwarding topologies, right? How do we actually forward packets within that? Because otherwise, Simon doesn't have enough time to talk about control. The cool stuff. <laughs> so, so you, actually, you actually mentioned something really interesting there, and I think it's probably something worth highlighting. You actually, in your, in your sentence, you actually made the assumption that you actually have this control over a path of where traffic is going. And that actually allows you to open up very different maintenance possibilities in terms of how you treat the network. That is actually one of the key things that the C sphere actually gives you. It's very discrete control over traffic path. And it actually enables you to start thinking of maintenance events very differently than you would in a traditional network, which is just focused on tied to it. This concept, if it plays out, gives us the flexibility at this tier of virtualization that load balancers originally gave us with standard workloads yes, to bleed exactly. traffic off of one location to another set, yep. do maintenance, and then bleed back. Right. Right. So there's one of the things that really excited me about the Plexi solution when I first started hearing about it is the possibility of having very discrete control over traffic flows and having that be something that you can actually provide action on, whether it's actually provisioning, whether it's bandwidth control, or whether it's maintenance. I, I, got, I got to talk about forwarding, otherwise we're going to run out of time. <laughs> the best part of this solution is when we get to the software, so yeah. we have yeah, to yeah, so get I, I, I got to keep going. All the cool stuff is coming. So <laughs> while we're on set, um, so we were worried about the capacity of the east-west direction. This year, um, the, the number of land is, is going to increase in, uh, in you know, subsequent versions of the product um, significantly. Who told you that? I don't know. <laughs> 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 you've been here three days and something's all day three from Derek. It, just, it would just be a guess. Like, you know, it needs to be bigger yeah. and it would be coming more. Yeah. What is significant? Uh, two four, times. Like four times the number of landers. Uh, two, two times. Two, two times. times. Two times? Well, well, two times. Sometimes. Just to play on that, even your guy's idea of whatever your, your stacked ring architecture is, whatever that device is, that opens up all sorts of crazy ideas for inter even interconnecting rings. I want to hear yeah. about the 40 plane though, because I want to know how you're dealing with loops and stuff. Okay. So <laughs> let, let me let me quickly do that because then then Simon can actually explain this thing over here. I, we, there's this label of SDN that's sort of been floating around on some of the slides and everything else, right? So uh, without going into the virtues of SDN and everything else, the the key part for us is um, the switches themselves do not determine how they forward traffic. They're being told how they're forward traffic. So there's no protocols like spanning tree or trail um, or SPB or anything else that runs on the switches themselves where they go and figure out where traffic needs to go. Traffic is, topologies are, we call them topologies, forwarding topologies. They are calculated by a controller. Right? The controller is a piece of software. Simon will talk about it for, uh, for 45 minutes. That's a really cool part. So he'll explain you know, how you create affinities, how affinities then translate into calculated topology. So, Bear with me and make the assumption that there is this control thing that calculates how to forward traffic. What are the best topologies to move traffic right, between places on the ring? 
the controller tells the switches how traffic should be moved. And it's, it's different than OpenFlow, right? I'll go in, 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 into the merits of OpenFlow or not. Right? This, in, in our solution, the switches are being told at an at a abstract level what are the forwarding topologies, right? So they're not being told for a specific flow, how do I move this packet right, from, from this source to this destination. They're being giving instructions that says, how do I get to anything that sits behind this switch? Or how do I get to anything that sits behind that switch? How do I, how do I send that traffic? Which paths do I follow, right? I have lots of physical paths that I can take. Which ones do I need? Which ones do I use? How do I load balance between them? The switches are being told that in, in that kind of abstract kind of mechanism, right? It's a, it's a topology. It's how do I get there? And there's a, there's a reason why we put these little, little orange boxes on each one of the switches. Um, the switches are given those topologies, and then they make the traffic forwarding decisions uh, in accordance to those topologies. So if they get traffic, uh, they've been told that if that traffic needs to go to some place behind this switch here, they've been given a topology that says, any traffic that needs to go behind the switch, use these links. They're being told that by the controller. The controller has calculated what is the best mechanism to get from where you are to where you need to go. And you know, in many cases, it may be, well, I got two direct links. I'm going to load balance across those two links. And I'm going to simple, simply take destination marketers, one sits on one link, destination marketers, one, two sits on the other link. I'm going to sort of split that load between those two. So that sort of sounds like the output of a trill or a fabric path in the or FSPF think, think, calculation. Absolutely. Think think about it in, in those terms. Right? It's not it's, it's 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 different than an SPF calculation, but it but it is well, you're absolutely correct in that it is it is a the result of a calculation that leads into this is a forwarding topology. I'll give you the results of how to forward with that. Well to get to this Mac, I send it to this guy over here. Correct. Next top. Correct, yeah. And basically, what our controller is is a topology computer, right? It's, it's just it's it's different from Dijkstra, right? It's actually computing stuff based on the affinity inputs, which is what you'll see later. But its output is uh, a set of topologies that you know that, that meet those inputs. Very important to note here: the controller is not a real-time controller, right? We are not expecting the controller to sit in the decision path or a flow. We are not even expecting the controller to react to failures. Like all of those are pre-computed and passed to the switch. So the switch truly is, once it's been given those topologies, it is independent in its choices of, based on the topologies, where to send traffic. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> a little, a little strange. <laughs> so, so what that means is, um, this switch here will get a set of topologies that says, how do I get to destinations that sit behind each one of these switches? And it's not just going to get those <laughs> topologies to say, OK, how do I get there now? It's also going to get a set of backup topologies. And a set of backup topologies account for every single possible failure in that path. So any switch that can fail, any link that can fail within that topology has a backup. Right? So it's been given a whole set of backup, hundreds of backup topologies. So whenever a switch fails and whenever a link fails, the switch independently can say, OK, I can't use that forwarding topology anymore because that link is no longer there. I'm going to look for the next one in my ordered list of topologies to use that do not use that link or do not use that switch, and I'll move to that forwarding topology. So they've been given the active topology and a whole slew, and they literally are hundreds of backup topologies that they will walk through whenever they encounter a failure. The goal here is very simple. The controller should never be real time. The control you should be able to turn the controller off and everything should just run. Right? There is no while the controller is ultimately in charge of calculating topologies, packet forwarding doesn't go through the controller, the control doesn't even get consulted. Um, failures, link failures, switch failures, sure, the controller will, will know about it because someone tells him, but the switches do not need new instructions from the controller to figure out how to deal with that. That's an important thing to understand, right? It is architecturally very deliberately not a real-time controller. It sits off to the side as an optimizer rather than a, than a you know active participant in forwarding traffic. So I talked about forwarding, right? So these topologies have been given. So for layer two, um, yeah, it's obviously very simple. A packet comes in, uh, needs to go to a destination that sits behind here. Um, this switch has been given a bunch of topologies that says, how do I get to everything, everyone that's behind 
this switch. By the way, we know that A is behind that switch because all these switches communicate. So MAC addresses are exchanged between all the switches. So every switch has a view of where all the MAC addresses are. Um, is, that, are the, is that by flooding, I assume? No, there's a control protocol that we exchange that way. So we, we, don't, we don't flood them. So they don't learn in the traditional bridge way. We only learn on an access port here. And then there is an active communication between all the switches to exchange MAC addresses. So it's between the switches and not from the switch to the controller to the switch? Correct. It is between the switches and then also to the controller. So the controller will have it, but the controller is not in the path of that distribution. Interesting. Right? So a packet comes in. So what, uh, if, it's, well, I mean, so what if it's not cached? It's got to learn somehow. Mm -hmm. It's flooded. Right. Okay. So if, if we don't so know about it, we'll flood. Flooding is localized to the switch, or is it flooded to the broadcast? It's, it's actually flooded, flooded throughout the ring. Okay. Just, just like a regular switch right. network would do, if we don't know where a MAC address is, we'll flood it until one of the switches has learned it. The moment one of the switches has learned it, he'll pass it to everybody else, and everybody else will know where that, where that MAC address is. So in this case, packet comes in here. Destination is A behind there. We know what's behind switch number A. We figure out which topology are we supposed to use to get to this switch over here. We'll stick the packet on one of the links within that topology based on right, some load balancing metric that we've, we've been provided. That's basically layer 240. Right, so yes, we flood to go and find out where MAC addresses are. Once it's learned, once it's once One switch learns it. Every one moment. switch learns it, passes around. Every switch will know where every, every MAC address is. Doesn't mean it gets installed into hardware. Right, because obviously hardware has limitations on how many MAC addresses you can support. Um, it is exchanged. That little orange box, the controller, the control plane there, knows where that MAC address is. We'll only install it in hardware if it's needed. Or if it's an active communication through that switch, we'll be actually install it in the hardware. So if I have 200,000 MAC addresses that would blow out a CAM table, you're pushing those into a hash upstream on to I will only push those into hardware, the ones that I'm actively using on that switch. Now does that go north to the controller? So we also send a copy to the controller. The controller knows where all the MAC addresses are at. But that, that's the QD computing the topology layer we're trying. Okay. <coughs> so they went, when, 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 soon, Martin's going to jump on. Really, <laughs> really, really soon, Simon will yeah. tell you how the controller is using it's it. It's actually very important, because then it really brings us together when you see how we if, if you're forced to tell that to each of these switches and configure them manually, you don't have much of a solution, right? So it has to work from a overall control perspective. But you understand why we're digging into this side of it, because this is, this is the failure side we understand. Yeah. Right. And then understanding the software layer, you're right, Rob. But I think this will, this, we'll get onto the software, and Martin can, can, can stay there and, and answer stuff, and I think it'll, it'll <laughs> so solidify value, yeah. everything we're saying when we go into the software. Value and complexity is in the software. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. 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 So I, I'll, you can, I'll be, you can pretty I'll, much You can pretty much assume that the product is a forwarding plane that's better than your Ethernet, otherwise you're not going to buy it. Right. Right? So the values in the software, that's what I really want to see is the software. And, so yeah. I, and, 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 and let, me, let me get there real quick. I'll be the first to say, right, the, the, the switch for us right, in the forwarding is simply a tool, right? It is simply a, it's cool because it's got some cool technology. I'm just putting you know, my laptop but, here. But it's, but it's worry, really not nothing more here. than a tool to enable, yeah. right, the very control. If function. you couldn't emulate and trill at the very least, we'd have a problem. <laughs> right? So your features are going to have to be at least that or greater. Right. So the assurance that I would go away with is that the forwarding path, there's an answer for all of these objections Correct. that you're going to have because they'll have fallen out. Because if they're not better or smarter than what the existing vendors are, they're not going to be in business. Right? Right. So one, one other part, one of the benefits of kind of starting from scratch using custom off-the-shelf off the silicon was that we could choose what kind of CPU to have to that individual box. So aside from being able C2 to C2 is the local dish, controller, right? Correct. Yeah, the, on the box itself, we have multiple Intel um, cores running. You know, we have infinite capability to, to extend software there. Um, so you could almost argue that you know, on its own, it's already cool to have our switches because we've got 5x, if not more, capacity than most others that run you know, as a software access there. So we haven't skipped on any of those. No. Uh, so those so let, me, let me make. Let me make two more points, and then, then Simon can talk about the real cool stuff. So I talked about generic forwarding, right? How do I get to a destination that's behind a switch somewhere? What I haven't talked about is specifically, if I have very definitively created an affinity between two endpoints, right? So I have, I have an application here and an application there, and I've asked or I've told the controller that application requi requires their traffic to be isolated from everybody else. Right? 
that, that is very specifically told to the switches, right? The switches are being told very specifically about that communication. And it's being matched by the switch, put on a specific link, right? Let's assume it's this one. And that switch is also being instructed, nothing else can go on that link. So that link may be not part of any other forwarding topology because we've asked specifically only that communication will go on that link. Everything else is pushed off to the side. Right? And that's where the controller comes in. Right? It actually starts making those decisions between, well, if you've asked me for you know, high bandwidth kind of communication between these two or isolated communication between those two, I need to take all the other topologies and move traffic out of the way. So I may need to go for other traffic. I may need to go this way because you've specifically said this direct connectivity, I want it dedicated between A, a and B. Those are the types of things that Simon will talk about what the controller can do. Last point I want to make, IP forwarding, because, because you asked. Um, I talked about this as sort of basic layer two forwarding, right? Layer three forwarding, again, slightly different paradigm here. Every switch will forward will be the default gateway for every single VLAN, right? So when a packet comes in here for, you know, on VLAN 10, needs to go to something here on VLAN 100, this switch here will route it. Within our fabric or within our connectivity, all VLANs exist, right? So VLAN, VLAN 100 actually exists at the back end of this one here. He will route that packet, layer two, follow this topology, find its way over here, and now on the way back, traffic on the way back will be routed here. Right, so we route on the ingress switch. The first switch you hit is the one that will route. All switches share the same default gateway address for a specific VLAN. They all share the same MAC address for a specific VLAN. Right, so no matter where you are, right, a VLAN can exist anywhere on that ring. The default gateway is going to be the same. IP address is going to be the same. MAC address is going to be the same. And it's not because we've designated one of these switches to be the router for that VLAN. It was because every switch is a router for that VLAN. Does that make sense? Right, so this means that router traffic doesn't need to go to a specific switch. First switch that sees it will route it cool. for every single VLAN. Yes. It's the software I want to say. Software. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really care about switching <laughs> Wow. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I believe you. I mean, it's all explained. I mean, to me, it's, you know, so it's, 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 it's